God. Open your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. I'll read one, two, three verses. Then I'll be speaking on the signs of the times. Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. Shout amen. amen. Verse number one, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Somebody shout a sign. Amen. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And um, in the morning, it will be foul weather today. Why? For the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites. That's not a very good sign. You can discern the face of the sky. You can read the times by looking at the sky. But can you not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we pray that today you will breathe in our hearts. Breathe in our hearts. Teach us. Inspire us. Help us to understand the times we live in. In Jesus' name. Signs of the times. The topic I'm speaking on is signs of the times. Signs of the times. Signs are very important to living a good life. And times are very important for spirituality. You cannot be spiritual or you cannot be a man of the spirit by ignoring the times you live in. The key statement there is signs of the times. And people say, well, pastor, maybe we are living in the times of the signs. I remember preaching a sermon years ago, and I turned it around. I said, this is a generation that's living in the times of the signs. There are so many signs in the scriptures spoken of by Prophet Daniel, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Peter, Apostle Paul. All of a sudden, it occurred to me and dawned upon me that these are the times of the signs. God spoke about the signs of the times. And I look, we are living in those times of manifestation of the signs. There are so many signs mentioned in the Bible. Uh, but a man, any man that wants to know God, walk with God, must never ignore the times. Jesus came in the fullness of time. Everything God does is on time. Time. God looks at seasons and times to manifest himself and his glory. The Bible is a book of prophecy. The Bible is a book of prophecy. Not just a book of prosperity. Not just the law of God. Not just the word of God. Not just a book of instructions. But also a book of prophecy. And many Christians today shy away from biblical prophecy. We shy away from scriptural prophecy and many pastors as well do not want to spend time in the prophetic anymore we don't want to spend time studying bible prophecies signs are very important and that's why it's important for us all to understand the times we live in what do i mean how do you know signs are important for you to know that your wife is pregnant why there are some bodily signs that her body will be giving her she may not know when she conceived she may not know how she conceived or precise moment but the moment she begins to feel certain signs or see certain signs in her body, the vomiting, the coughing, the nausea, so I'm feeling something. What does she do? Let me go for a blood test. She runs a test and says, wait a minute, I'm pregnant. But what led you to the hospital? Some signs in my body. How do you know you're sick? You feel some signs in your body. Maybe headache. And you feel some tiredness in your body. And your wife tells you, what's wrong with you? I don't know. Is this I'm feeling somehow, you know? You say to yourself, I'm feeling somehow. My body is giving me some signs that all is not well. What do you do? You rush to the hospital, you take your blood or urine test, you ask a doctor, you don't know what's wrong with you, but you're just feeling tired these days. You're feeling weary these days. And they ask you some questions. You say, no, I'm okay. I ate my diet. is okay. Okay, let's do some tests. Oh, sir, you got fever. Oh, sir, you got this. And they tell you what's wrong with you. But what informed you? Signs. Arjuna is going to rain. You look at the sky. You see that the sky is lowering. Wait a minute. It's dark. It's cloudy today. And what's going to happen today? It's going to rain heavily. In fact, we have professionals. We call them meteorologists. They study the sky and they tell us when it's going to rain. They can never give you forecasts for the next one month. 
So if we obey human forecasters, human meteorologists, that tell us by looking at the sky what will happen the next one week or two weeks, and then it affects how we change, it affects how we plan, if the nation knows that there's going to be a huge flood the next 20 days in Lagos, Lagos State will call a major meeting. They will evacuate some land. Say, wait a minute, we understand from meteorological evidence that Lagos is going to have a downpour, like almost a tsunami. You find people working and planning. They won't go to work. Why? We are obeying the signs. The signs that we are seeing tells us things are not as smooth or as okay. When it comes to spiritual matters, how come we don't want to discern times and signs? How come? How come? What kind of times are we living in? Naturally speaking, humanly speaking, we all listen to signs. We all observe signs. There is no man here who does not observe signs. We all do, one way or the other. We make decisions based on some signs, bodily, financial, many things that go around. You all do that. We all make decisions based on our signs, the things we get from around us. Even people, human beings, make some serious decisions, those that are superstitious. You know, when they see that, this morning I'm going out, you know, when I was much younger, my late father said that with your left palm, is itching you. They say, money is coming. So every week I'll be praying that my, my left palm itch me, and the left palm will refuse to itch me. I say, itch, itch, itch in Jesus' name. So I can say, money cometh. <laughs> and they tell you, ah, if you are going on the street and you left like heat, don't go out anymore. There is danger on the road. So one day, maybe you are going left, ah, I'm not going anymore. It's a sign that there is danger on the road. How come we make such decisions? By those superstitious signs. We all believe in these things. Tell, I tell you the truth. We all do. One way or the other. Some even take it further. Some take it deeper. The dreams that they receive every day are signs of what to do every month. People like visions and dreams. They come to pastors like us. Give me a sign. They came to Christ. Give us a sign from heaven about the times we live in. What do I say is give us a vision. Have you seen anything? Christ said, you people are hypocrites. Why? Give us a vision. They wanted him to say, ah, and I see a vision in the heavenlies of this, this, this happening. And Christ refused to. He said, the only sign I will give to you is the sign of prophet Jonah. And he gave them a sign. But they didn't understand it spiritually. Why? He was going to be in the grave for three days and three nights. He said, that's the only sign to let you know that we are living in the end of times. And they didn't know. They had no clue that he was speaking prophetically about his own death and burial before his resurrection and ascension. They didn't have any understanding. He gave them a sign, but they were too blind to understand the sign. He said, no sign will be given to you, you hypocrites. But the sign of prophet Jonah, I will go to the graves, I will go to the belly of the grave, and I'll be there for three days and I will come out again. And then I will preach to Nineveh. Mm. Let me go there. You won't repent. But I'll still preach to you. Signs of the times. What kind of times do we live in? So to know the times, let's check the signs. Is that okay? I'm not going to convince, I'm not speaking on the times of the signs. Because that would be a different thing. But I want to speak about the signs. Pestilences will show up. No, you don't know. Because they have told you it's all about prosperity. The churches have refused to preach about the times, so we think the times are not here. They are here. That's why I'm angry with some of our colleagues that refuse to preach eschatology. It's not to frighten the church, it's to inform and prepare the church. If Jesus spoke about it, why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? If in this world only we have hope, we of all men most miserable. There must be hope beyond this earth. There must be hope beyond this earth. We don't speak it anymore. I, I hardly find on the pulpit on teachers teaching about the end of times. I don't know why this generation just wants to live in self-denial. We're living in self-denial. The fact that we don't teach it, we don't hear it, or we don't want to hear it does not mean it's not there. It is there. It's there. It's living in denial. I don't want to know. I want to go to know. Pastor, please, don't talk about heaven or about hell. I don't care about hell. You don't want to hear about hell, but hell is there. You don't have to want to hear about hell for hell to not exist. It doesn't de it's not determined by what you want to hear. It is there. Ebola is there. 
Don't tell me, Pastor. Hey, hey, fear. Okay, I won't tell you, but it is there. You better know about it so you can know how to prevent it. Wash your hand every day. Be careful. I mean, Pastor P was saying it fearfully and frightfully the other day, not faithfully. Now, one church, they won't say that you shouldn't be shaking hands anymore. Because if you say, hold oh, somebody, tell him how you love him. Put your hands together and praise the Lord. Ebola, hold oh, somebody. Ebola, tell him how you love him. <laughs> In the church, we are so scared of holding somebody. I don't know. Tell him now you love him. Ebola. What if the guy's got Ebola? And you want to hold somebody? I beg, I beg. Pastor, change that song. Don't say hold anymore. Say point to somebody. Tell him how you love him. I love you. Don't put your hands together. Raise your hands to heaven and praise the Lord. That's better. <laughs> oh, praise God. Any man that wants to study the Bible must also understand that the Bible speaks about the future. The Bible says to us there, not only a book of instructions from God about what we should do, what we should not do, not just only a book of laws or rules, this book of the law. No, the Bible is not just the book of the law or book of instructions or book of rebuke on how to live our daily lives, but it's also a book of what? Prophecy to show us the future. And so we're going to look at the Bible today and see some prophetic statements about the future. We love, we love Philippians more than Colossians, more than Ephesians, more than Revelations. We don't want the book that tells us about the future. We don't like the book of prophecy, the book that reveals tomorrow, the book that is deep, written by heaven himself. God came to John and said, these are the things that will happen hereafter, tomorrow. The time is at hand. We don't like such books. They are too deep. They are too deep for us. So we run away from such books. The Bible says there's a blessedness therein. We like the book of instruction and motivation. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15 to 17 says, All scriptures is given by inspiration of God. It's good for motivation. It's good for instruction. It's good for rebuke as well. That the man of God... We like all those small, small, small things. It makes us feel, yes, we are Christians. But no, we have to understand this book beyond all that. Praise the Lord. The Bible says to us in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, that there were some men of Issachar that understood the times. He was speaking about when David became king. And in speaking about when David became king, he said to us there very clearly that there were some men, unlike other tribes of Israel that came, many tribes of Israel came, and they brought all kinds of support. We will give you 10,000 soldiers. We will give you 2,000 soldiers. We will give you 10,000 soldiers. Tribe of Benjamin. Tribe of Judah. When they became king. But there was this tribe of Issachar. That was the children of Issachar. Which were men that had understanding of the times. To know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200. And all their brethren were at their commandment. They gave the least in terms of human contribution to the army of David. Why? You know why? They knew it wasn't the time of war. They understood that, no, this guy is now Saul is gone. His house is gone. We don't need to begin to equip David to fight his own people. Just give 200 counselors. Others are bringing in 12,000, 30,000. They say, no, 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 you don't need it. Just 200 people. Go. Why? Because we know the times. It's this guy's time. No opposition. Nobody will fight him. So they gave the least in terms of human contribution to the army. Because they were not taking it emotionally. They were not doing it sentimentally. They were doing it with a lot of understanding. They understood the times. They knew that this is a time not of war. We just give this guy 200 people and they'll be there. And that's where we are right now. Most Christians don't even understand the times we live in. So we make decisions we invest quite a lot of money into things we shouldn't. We say, hey, maybe let's hoard money. Let's, no, that's, it's not a time to hurt. It's not a time to keep buying cars. No, no, we don't know the times we're living in. It's not a time to start buying stocks and shares. No, don't start buying lands and houses. No, you don't know the times you're living in because the hand is near. Be careful how you begin to frightfully or fearfully invest into stocks, into houses, into oil and gas. No, forget it. The time is at hand. How are you sure this country in 2015? Do we know the times we're living in? What do we know about 2015 for Nigeria? Nobody's telling us. Nobody's saying to us what God is revealing to us. 
So people are still going around with their days, their life, buying and selling it. They say, oh, we didn't know. Nobody told us. Men of Issachar Isa understood the times and what Israel ought to do. <laughs> if you understand the times, it will inform you on what you ought to do. No panic buying, no panic support. I know the times we're living in. So I won't just pump people into a particular thing or pump money into it. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Open your Bibles again with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Hallelujah. I will speak about five major signs. Verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Look at those two words. The times and the seasons. Now, the word times and seasons are two different words in, in Greek. One is kairos, one is chronos. The word chronos, C-H-R-O-N-H-O, is of the family of what chronology, which has to do with orderly event of things. I can give you the chronology of my father and genealogy of my mother. However, the word kairos speaks about an occasion, an event. It's different from chronos. So you can have a kairos moment in a chronos. There are so many chronos, kairos in chronos. So when it says the times, there are some events that these are and seasons. This is a kairos time within this chronos. Now, chronologically, the world, the man in this world, from the Bible standpoint, Bible is 6,000 years. Now, from archaeologists, they say 1 million years. How come archaeology and Bible is a bit different? Some have said man had existed before Adam. Some say the first word, all kinds of stories. Or the earth had existed years long before God now made man. Whatever. Man on earth, from the time of Adam till today, the Bible tells us, the Bible, not science, not archaeology, the Bible tells us in 6,000 years that man has lived on earth. That's what the Bible tells us. Now it's up to you to choose what you want to believe. Science, archaeology, if they tell us something different, there may be some reasonable answers for these few contradictions. But no one will say, no, the Bible is a lie because one scientist says so. No! No, that's, that's where some church people and some knowledgeable people have become so theoretically sound that they become theologically bereft. They use the theories of this world to now know the theologies of God. Then I said, no, 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 the Bible must be wrong. Why? Because one doctor, so, so, and so, or Dr. Darwin said the earth is one million years. So Dr. Darwin is right. Prophet Moses is wrong. Prophet Abraham is wrong. Sorry, Prophet David is wrong. Sorry, the God that spoke to them is wrong. Why? Because one Charles Darwin said so. It's madness for you to believe Charles Darwin and the glow God. It's madness. It's the height of insanity. Who is Darwin? Who can say Darwin? When did Darwin become authority on matters or spiritual matters? Spiritual matters? One of the greatest, greatest manifestation of an apostatized church is our agreeing with homosexuality and bestiality. It is unbelievable, unbelievable for you to know how, how bad the church has become. The church has now agreed in the Western world that there's nothing wrong with man and man. Mary, that is the height of apostasy. Remember Lord's wife. Because he's speaking to Christians. Remember Lord's wife. Those ones, the Lord's wife will tell you, I'm not a pseudomite. I'm not, I don't believe in homosexuality. But at the same time, you're not condemning it. You're not condemning it. We have bastardized Christian faith. We have criminalized ourselves. We fight in public, our pastors are no longer into winning souls of men. And we shouldn't do that. One thing God told me this morning when I was in prayers was that how can I birth peace when I'm not prince? He said, it's so easy. That's why it's called prince of peace. For God to birth peace, he has to be the prince of that place. In other words, we need to enthrone God again. Enthrone Christ. Enthrone God as the prince of our land as a king of our land, then we will find peace in our land. And I pray in Jesus' name that God will indeed manifest himself in Nigeria once again as the prince of peace. Nigerians have been known to be happy people even when things are tough. You know, people just know that Nigerians will always smile and be happy. But all of a sudden, 
Our smiles are taken off our faces these days. Our joy is being diminished on a daily basis. We are beginning to embrace fear in our hearts and we should not get there. Let's keep our hearts together. Let's keep our hearts, let's unite as one. Regardless of tribe, Hebrew, Yoruba, Awusa, Tif, let's come together. Let's, 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 let's put the enemy to flight. Let's embarrass the devil. Let Boko Haram be put to shame. Let's tell them, no matter what you do, we are a people and we will forever be a people. We'll continue to live as a people. Regardless of tribe, tongue, and religion, let's be one people and live in peace. My prayer is simple. It was a song of degrees of David. David sang this song and he said there, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built up as a city that is compacted together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord, for there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of God. Then it says in verse number 6, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. If you read verse 1 and verse 6 together, it makes sense to me. I was glad when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord. But please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know why? If your land is in turmoil, there will be no church to go to. If there is chaos, crisis, death, fear, people will no more go to the house of the Lord. I pray that we will not get to the point where the house of the Lord will be empty because of chaos, war, and terror in our land. May I pray with this nation? Just as a prophet who pray for a land, I want to ask God, he says, if my people, in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We are God's people. Heavenly Father, I pray for this land, I pray for Nigeria, as your servant and on behalf of your people, I lift up holy hands, I cry today and ask for I pray for the peace of my Jerusalem. I pray for the peace of this land. From Meduguri to Lagos, from Shokoto to Calabar, I pray for this peace at the seat of power in Abuja. I pray for our president that will give him wisdom and understanding to lead us all to the land of peace. I ask, Lord, that you will superintend over the affairs of Nigeria as the Prince of Peace. You are the Prince of Peace. Give us peace in this land. In the name of Jesus, let our land know peace. Let our land embrace peace. Let our land embrace prosperity. For there will be no prosperity without peace. Help us, O God, according to your word. It's only when we have peace in Jerusalem that we can prosper. Lord, help us to prosper. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Pray that prayer on a regular basis. Very simple prayer. That God will give us peace in this land. That God will give our leaders a heart that will work for peace, not just prosperity. Because the psalmist says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. There will be no prosperity in a land that knows no peace. Prosperity will elude them. Investments will elude them. May we have peace so we can prosper. Thank you and God bless. For more of Rev. Yomika Sali's messages, watch him on YouTube, Rev. Yomika Sali. For inspirational quotes on Twitter, follow at Yomi underscore Kasali and our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Church.